The first thing for me to say is this talk is entirely my views. I'm not here representing the all-party parliamentary group on AI, um, although I'm quite happy to take questions and tell you what's going on there, um, because none of that's secret. Uh, nor Imperial College or the University of Sussex. I'm just speaking for myself here. Uh, and you'll have to forgive me, but uh, decades of talking to professional non-listeners or students, as we're supposed to call them now, means that I tend to put my take-home messages right at the beginning of the talk, um, because that's the only way you'll get through. Uh, and this is basically it. We're not prepared for a very big revolution. Um, and there are two think tanks, and I, I will name the guilty think tanks and the guilty universities uh, there. Uh, no one's really thinking about the employment issues. Uh, I, I mean, occasionally there are reports and occasionally MPs act very, very frightened by the employment issues. But really, um, a lot of this belongs to people within the field. Uh, and so that's why I'm stressing you need to think about the policy implications. Uh, you might think that uh, you're all right, Jack, like in the film, because uh, if you work in the IT industry, uh, certainly your employment position's not likely to be threatened. Uh, I wouldn't assume that's true uh, simplistically. You might want to think about it, but you can probably make a suitable sideways move if it is threatened. But the Future of Humanity, the Uhiro Institute for the Future of Humanity at Oxford, and not to be outdone, the Leverhulme Centre for the Future of Intelligence at Cambridge, are looking at uh, so-called existential threats, essentially whether or not robots will take over or AI will advance so fast that it will keep us as pets. I don't think those are real dangers, but if you do, you can uh, talk about it afterwards. I, I did publish a paper right at the beginning of this century, I think, on why there wouldn't be a robot takeover, um, but it, it does keep coming back. Uh, what I think are the real dangers are uh, unemployment, um, underemployment, in other words, humans being relegated to um, some really not very inspiring jobs, the loss of professional discretion uh, and, of course, state capture or regulatory capture. Um, I, I can say more about that if you like, but uh, already we've seen that, uh, to cut a long story short, information is the oil of the 21st century and uh, there are now information barons like Lord Zuckerberg, for example, who basically can tell governments what to do and do. Um, it, there's going to be a lot of that, I'm afraid. So um, I, I'm not going to say too much more about this, but one of the major policy implications is AI enables people right at the top of organisations or countries or the Communist Party of China, although I believe I'm forbidden by law from criticising them in any way, so I'm not criticising them in any way, but people at the top of these large organisations get a lot more power, uh, and those at the bottom get proportionately less. That's an important policy implication which isn't being discussed. Uh, also, science fiction, I think, misleads you. Um, it's important to say, I mean, for the techies in the audience, and, and even the non-techies in the audience, that Artificial intelligence, uh, even in 2021, is still a very big name for what you get. Um, it, whether or not it's even intelligence, we might uh, struggle with. Uh, nowadays, AI tends to mean machine learning, uh, and even that's a big name for what, in fact, is a, a variety of statistical techniques which are very good at finding patterns, if there are any, and predicting patterns, if there are any to be predicted, in large data sets. Um, whether or not that's intelligence is, is a philosophical question that's kind of outside the scope of this talk. Uh, but it, it's not a magic technology. Uh, it, it, it's very, very effective. It's very, very powerful. Uh, because of uh, what we have now, 
in, in 2021 are massive data sets. Google, for example, store every click that every user has ever made in the last three years, vast amount of data. Uh, and what AI can do, uh, even if you just see it as statistical analysis, is find the patterns in that. And those patterns are very, very informative. Um, I don't know why I'm ending up picking on Google tonight, but I, I was at a conference uh, a year or two ago when um, uh, someone quite senior in Google actually said to the audience, we know more about our users than they know about uh, themselves. Uh, therefore, dot, dot, dot. So that's the sort of power that they're claiming. Um, autonomous vehicles, not much in the news lately, but I think they're coming. Um, I, I have students typically say, oh, but we can still do the supervisory jobs if the robots do the menial jobs. What, of course, they're missing, and, and what a lot of people are missing is when it comes to supervision, computers are much, much better than humans. They don't get distracted. They don't get bored. Um, so when it comes to supervising, uh, I'm unfortunately, we're going to lose those first. Um, it, even 20 years ago, I was moaning that, uh, that Sussex University had a photocopier that was quite prepared to object to the amount of white space I had on my slides and reorganize the aesthetics for me. But if the paper jammed, it expected me to open the cover and stick my fingers into the hot works. And if it ran out of paper, it couldn't even send an email to get some paper. And as far as I know, photocopies are still being produced like that. Very good at commenting on uh, the layout of your slides, but not so good at doing the menial tasks. Um, I'm also predicting a, continual, a continuing hollowing out here. In other words, it's the middle class who are really under threat in this. And just you know, as an aside, present tax models are going to fail because present tax models are based on most people working, most people earning enough to pay tax. Um, in, in any future scenario where that's not the case, and I've gently put it to you that it already isn't the case, uh, in that <coughs> even conservative governments have to push up the minimum wage, uh, just so they're not subsidizing very low wage rates by employers. Uh, but certainly for future societies, we, we really do need to come up with new tax models. None of this really is being talked about. The um, acronym at the end there is a Whitmyism. It stands for this is not an exhaustive list. I'm not claiming to have covered all the policy implications by any means. But here are some that I think have been missed. Um, and I'd now like to pose a question. I, I'm not going to apologize that this talk contains more questions than answers, because I'm afraid that's the nature of this area. There are more questions than answers. And that, so I'm not apologizing for that. There's, in fact, there's two questions here. So what are good jobs for robots? My first response is, why has nobody asked this question? Indeed, uh, it, it kind of um, got me, really, it's one of the things that got me interested in the area. What jobs do we want robots to do? Um, and here's some suggestions. Here's Whitby's suggestions. Space exploration. Um, there's a, a nice new uh, robot on Mars called Perseverance, and I would call that a good robot. And, and since I'm a robot ethicist, I think I'm, in I'm entitled to say which robots are good robots, and that is a good robot. Space exploration, good job for robots. Dangerous work. Um, I, for some reason, um, people identify so strongly with, with the dangerous work of mining that they feel very threatened if it stops. But I, frankly, I think uh, mining, particularly coal mining, uh, which was uh, the staple industry of, of, uh, uh, of where I grew up and a lot of this country at one time, is unspeakably dangerous and clearly a job for a robot. Um, the, there's other show people risk their necks um, uh, repairing track side line side features on railways and so on, putting cones out on motorways to do repairs. Again, there's no, really no reason why we should be throwing humans into these dangerous jobs. There's also a lot of monotonous tasks in which I've included driving and flying and accounting. Uh, you may or may not agree. Um, and uh, 
security. Security, in fact, is an area where I'm constantly being called in as an ethicist. Uh, if anybody wants to ask any questions about it, there's probably a limit to what I can say ethically because some of the work is uh, officially secret for organizations that don't exist. And a lot of the work is co uh, commercially sensitive. But uh, one thing uh, I'm prepared to say is a lot of companies think they can hook AI software up to security cameras with which, for example, London is very, very well equipped uh, and using an AI program spot crimes before they happen, uh, uh, spot suspicious behavior and react to it. Um, and a lot of the time I say I'm not entirely convinced, uh, but I don't know that I can say any more about that. Uh, certainly, if you get a call from your credit card company saying uh, we're just a little bit concerned because there's been an unusual pattern of expenditure on your card, you don't normally buy yachts in Newcastle, uh, that will have been spotted by an AI program. Um, indeed, some of my ex-students set up a company to do precisely that. Uh, one thing that uh, deep learning, artificial neural nets, the sort of statistical analysis programs that I've been talking about, one thing they're very good at is detecting when something unusual happens in a computer system. Uh, they're quite good at spotting the unusual 24-7 looking for it. So maybe that's a job. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. OK, um, now by contrast, I've got another question here. Tell me why not employ a human? People normally push back and say humans don't want to do teaching. Um, and it, it's uh, interesting. It, it's a uh, a human human interaction job. I'm not really sure why we would want robots to do it. And indeed, I, I put teaching first there because I must have spent 20 or 30 years in the company of people who were designing uh, intelligent tutoring systems that were called ITS at one time, um, all, all manner of uh, systems to uh, deliver teaching. Uh, if you're a teacher or know a teacher, um, don't expect to be made unemployment uh, uh, to expect to be made unemployed by these systems anytime soon because uh, online tutoring systems, uh, intelligent tutoring systems, so on are really not very good. But at, at some point it occurred to me, why do we think this is a job that humans can't or shouldn't do? This is not dangerous. This is not space exploration. This is, you know, going into a room and, and teaching. Um, but nonetheless, uh, people do think this job needs to be automated. I'm not sure why. I'll assume that most of you don't know what CCBT stands for. Very interesting area. Um, I, I, well, the World Health Organization has declared depression an epidemic in a number of countries, including Britain. Uh, and because in Britain we have the National Institute of Clinical Excellence and Health, which looks at therapies, it will only recognize one type of talking therapy for depression, namely cognitive behavioral therapy. Nothing to stop you getting Freudian stuff or any other therapy if you pay yourself. But if you expect the taxpayer to pay for your talking treatment for depression, then it's cognitive behavioral therapy because that's the only one that appears to work in double blind tests. But the National Institute of Clinical Excellence and Health has also recognized computer cognitive behavioral therapy. This is psychotherapy administered by a computer. And again, it appears to work. Maybe not quite as good as human therapy, um, although there is a class of patients, um, uh, particularly suicidal young men, where the computer administered psychotherapy seems to be better than human administered psychotherapy. And normally when I give a talk like this to the public, I say, if I was a therapist, I'd be a little bit threatened by the fact that computers seem to be able to do it nearly as well as me. But they never are. Explain that if you like. Robot Nannies, um, there's a whole lot of stuff on Robot Nannies published by uh, Nolan Amanda Sharkey in Sheffield. So Sharkey and Sharkey would be the, the names to look at, in, including a contribution by me. Um, 
robot nannies are exactly what they say. They're robots. Uh, and I, you know, I would say under UK law, I assume I used to say under EU law, and I'm an ethics expert for the European Commission, but I don't know. I, I assume the UK has kept following Brexit the same legal position. Uh, uh, so under UK law, it would be illegal to leave your child in the care of a robot. But it's not in all countries. And in some countries, particularly Japan and Singapore, it's regarded as a very good way to uh, care for children. These are not very sophisticated machines, but um, they can they can do the basics. They can <laughs> they can follow uh, a toddler. They can show you TV pictures on your phone of what your toddler's up to while you're down the pub uh, and play things to entertain the toddler. Um, uh, the problem with robot nannies is, well, again, why not employ a human? Um, and uh, obviously they're being made in countries that don't have the same regulatory framework as this one. Uh, nothing to stop you importing one. Um, maybe you already have. Uh, but as I say, would be uh, currently under UK law illegal to use it for the purpose for which it was built. Um, Healthcare, a lot of pressure to use robots in healthcare. Um, I, I'm thinking particularly of the of the one to one of the um, the the, <coughs> the caring professions rather than telemedicine, which has been a good deal more successful. If anybody's interested, I can say more about these, but I'm going to have to press on to cover such a broad area. Um, intimate roles, I'll just say. Um, I've given loads of public talks called Do You Want a Robot Lover? Question mark. The question is important. Uh, and out of that grew uh, a paper. It's in a collection called Robot Ethics, uh, published by the MIT Press, edited by Lynn Beakey and Abney called Do You Want a Robot Lover? Um, I Well, I, I think if you do, you possibly haven't thought through the consequences it's um, it's not as an attractive as an option as as you might think. And anyway, why are we saying these are jobs for robots? Um, when <laughs> it, it seems again, my question at the top of the slide: Why would you not employ a human? Um, as for robot lover, you know, if you can't find a human to act as your lover, then that's a problem we ought to address because this planet is well and truly infested with human beings. There's 7 billion more, more than 7 billion humans on this planet. The idea that we need to build a machine for companionship is very, very interesting. I mean, you know, the problem is getting away from humans, not, uh, not a shortage of them. Um, there really needs to be a broader discussion about that particular area of development. But as I say, you could you could read my paper in the uh, MIT Robot Ethics Collection. Um, creative work. You know, a lot of people trying to get robots to write novels, get AI systems to write novels, get them to produce pictures and so on. And I constantly ask these people why. And of course, if you're in a research environment, a university, they say, well, we want to explore what creativity is. You know, we're not really interested in replacing creative people. We're just interested in finding out how it works. So we're good scientists, not uh, not trying to create unemployment. Um, maybe that's a little bit disingenuous. I've got a question mark after programming there. I happen to think programming is creative. It's almost always creative. And for various reasons, the creative aspect of it is rarely acknowledged. But if, if that's what you mainly do, Again, why would you want it to be automated? Just leaving the question there. Uh, I think uh, in all these discussions, some things that have been missed. The 99% problem, uh, I can't really claim credit for thinking all this up, but um, I haven't seen it in print very much, so maybe I could claim it. Essentially, when people automate a process, they can get uh, a system either a, a, an AI system or a robot or an autopilot uh, uh, or <clears throat> some sort of autonomous vehicle to do 99% of the, 
of the task as it's done by human beings. They then put a lot of effort into saying the remaining 1% either doesn't matter or we'll soon sort that out and so on. But typically, 99% um, is automated and the other bit is, is forgotten, buried, or just this, we just declare it unimportant. Uh, the question of responsibility, I published extensively on that in the 1980s. I'm going to say some more about that, but people don't talk about who takes responsibility for these systems. Uh, they don't talk much about human values because we, we're not very much uh, at present. We're not very good at agreeing what those values are, certainly not across the world. Um, or even within a country. There's, there's too much debate about that. Uh, and by the new feudalism, I mean what I've already said, that in the 21st century, information is oil. We now have information barons. So Lord Zuckerberg owns an enormous estate in cyberspace. He has to employ uh, a few of the warrior class, um, a few samurai. Um, other, otherwise, hackers would move in on his estate. But what makes him one of the richest men on the planet is all over the world, the peasantry uh, are typing in information, which is what makes him rich for nothing. For the privilege of being on his estate, they, they tell him um, what they're doing. They put in pictures, they review music. Um, and because they do that for nothing, he's become very rich. This, this is a new, it's digital feudalism. And if you think I'm being particularly critical I have to say that in the all-party parliamentary group, none of which is secret, the parliamentarians, the MPs and peers are a good deal less complimentary. Uh, and whereas I've talked about information barons uh, and feudalism, they would talk of digital gangsters. Uh, they, uh, the idea that governments like these people, get that out of your head because they're a lot more critical than I am. Okay. Responsibility. Uh, 1988, in a very old textbook, uh, and in 2010, when I was part of a group set up by the EPSRC to come up with uh, uh, sort of Asimov's three laws for the 21st century, we came up with the, the principles of robotics. I was there. I argued very strongly, and no one disagreed in 2010, that there should always be uh, a human locus of responsibility. In other words, we should know who takes responsibility for the action of an AI program. Um, it's not a great job, and a lot of people in the field, um, I, well, I can see why no one would want to do it, but um, it, people like Demis Hassabis, the, uh, the creator of AlphaGo, um, the, the world champion, uh, or the, the Go program that beat the world champion, and now... Um, uh, the main, well, the, the director of Google DeepMind or Alphabet DeepMind, when you, know, you look at it, um, said of AlphaGo that there was no way of knowing why it did what it did. Um, and if you accept that's true, technically, and this is a technical question to which I, I will come back briefly if I have time, um, it's not really a policy question. It's a technical question, I think. If that's true, then, of course, it's very hard to take responsibility for the output of an AI program. Um, and, and so given what we know of human limitations, is this fair or ethical? I don't think Tesla, for example, are behaving in an ethical way in uh, selling a piece of software. <laughs> you don't really have any choice if you have a Tesla car because it downloads this stuff automatically overnight. Uh, in the fashion of modern IT, um, called autopilot, which suggests that the car will drive itself. However, you have to keep your hands on the steering wheel to take over when it messes up. Um, there is ample evidence from aviation. Um, if you want a particular example, I would say read through the report on the crash of Air France AF447. Um, there's ample evidence from aviation that humans cannot take over in minutes. And the idea, even when they're trained professionals and they supposedly know what they're doing with their aircraft, the idea that a human could take over from Tesla autopilot in nanoseconds is, an, well, uh, unrealistic, I think. Um, I hope I have time to say more about the, the technical issues here. Um, basically, 
if we are going to do responsibility in AI systems, we, we have um, the, the first problem is, do we know if it's the, the code or the weights, what the program has actually learned or the data on which it's been fed? If you don't think this is a problem, then you might want to look at uh, uh, Amazon's uh, CV sorting program, uh, which in, were built in 2015, which turned out to uh, completely discriminate against women. Indeed, it discriminated against uh, any slightest hint of femininity. Um, so if I put on my CV, for example, that I gave a talk at a girls' school last year, which I did, that would be enough for it to go, that word girls would be enough to get it straight in the bin. Nobody had told it to discriminate against women. It worked that out all for itself because it was trained on a data set of previous successful Amazon employees um, and Amazon couldn't fix it. Um, now, it's very hard to say whether or not the program was wrong there or it was, you know, correctly assessing the data with which it was presented. Um, so that's, that is the blame assignment problem. Um, beware of using modern machine learning techniques if you want anything good to happen, because they're, they're going to be inherently conservative, particularly if you train them on previous data, because what you're implicitly saying is give me more of the same. Uh, I've mentioned Demis Sasabis and AlphaGo. Uh, there's quite a debate in the AI ethics community with some people, um, I won't name them right now, but, but some prominent people saying, uh, ethically, we can't use these impenetrable systems in AI simply for the reason that when something goes wrong, we don't know who to blame. We can't do the responsibility thing. Um, I'd love to open what do you think there, because there's usually a very hard pushback from people who are enthusiastic about the, these particular types of programs saying, well, if you take that attitude, you just, you're, you know, you're just living in the last century. You have to accept that we now have these we we now have deep learning systems um, that uh, that literally we can't explain what they do. Um, I will say I will throw in here because I might just have enough time to, to say this. I I think uh, this is not a satisfactory state of affairs and I'm not the only person. Uh, the all party parliamentary group recommended couple of years ago or more that we should have in the UK a minister for AI at cabinet level. And I was one of the loudest voices saying we should have that. You'll have to ask me in the questions why we don't actually have one. Um, and even then, I'm not sure I want to <laughs> give my opinion uh, over, over YouTube. But uh, if we did have a minister for AI at cabinet level, it would probably be Stephen Metcalf, who's the MP, he's co-chair of the all-party parliamentary advisory group, um, together with Tim Clement Jones, who's a Lib Dem, Lib Dem peer. But Stephen Metcalf is a Tory MP and would probably get the job, or would be certainly first choice for the job. Um, and he said in a meeting few years back, he said the reason he went into AI is because a constituent approached him. She'd been turned down for a mortgage and the finance company said, we can't tell you why it's an AI program. Uh, there's no way of finding out why. Uh, so she went to her MP and he started asking questions about it. And that's what got him interested in it. Um, my personal view is in a lot of these cases, it, that's disingenuous. Can't tell you why the program produced the output really means won't tell you why, can't be bothered. Now, in some cases, I think it could be very difficult. Uh, if we had an autonomous vehicle that had learned driving behavior on a deep learning network and it did, it turned out to have an accident, there would be a lot of difficult questions to ask. Um, however, I think suitably technically aware people could work out why. Um, and the, re the way they would do that uh, in, on my suggestion is that they would have the power, like aviation investigators, to go to the company, however big and important this company was, that had produced the autonomous vehicle, and then not only see the code, but see the coders and get to talk to the coders and say, 
Why did you build it that way? Show me the code. How, how many times did you test this module? How many times did you test this module? What tests did you run? And uh, they could work out why. It would not be cheap, and it's not a job for journalists. It's not a job for lawyers. It's a job for a team of techies. Um, but uh, I see a job opportunity there. I'd have to say, I've mentioned it to some of my friends in the AI industry, and they've thrown it straight back at me and said, show me the money. Who's going to pay for this? And that, to that, I don't have an answer. But you can see that I don't think we have to suffer impenetrable systems. And certainly, if I'm talking to any techies here, I hope you can see that a suitably technically knowledgeable team could penetrate these systems. No system is really, truly impenetrable. It's just difficult to penetrate. And if there was, if there was money and motivation, it could be done. Just my view. You don't have to agree. <coughs> OK, uh, I'll just concentrate on what's in italics there. The time has come for international regulation of AI and robotics. I, I sincerely believe this. And I, I think, as I've said here, it has to be international. Right. It's pointless for an individual country to regulate alone. Um, robot nannies is a uh, uh, something I've talked about, robot nannies are produced in one country, imported. But then again, you could think about autonomous vehicles. What's the point of the UK having a law about autonomous vehicles when uh, either the vehicle itself or the software is made in some other country with different regulations? Um, and now software crosses the globe at the click of a mouse. The idea that you can somehow keep it out or refine it, I, I think that's, and, and you can see from the slide, uh, what year it was we recommended ministerial level representation. Um, I, I should say about ministerial level representation, I don't think it's going to be the job of the Minister for AI to tell the industry how to do AI. Quite the reverse. What I want is for the industry to tell the minister what they want the minister to say at international meetings. The job of the minister is to represent the UK AI industry which is one of the one of the most advanced in the world, I have to say. Now, I mean, in 10 years, things might be very, very different. But in, in 2021, it is one of the most advanced in the world. It's it's the job of the Minister for AI to represent that industry at international conferences because the regulation has to be international. Um, and here's my claims. Uh, that if we have international regulation, it won't reduce innovation or profit, and it will increase safety. And I have an existence proof for why I make that claim, and, <laughs> which is the Chicago Convention 1944 and 1947. Uh, I wonder if anybody knows about the Chicago Convention 1944. Well, here you go. It, <laughs> What essentially that happened in Chicago in 1944 was that 52 states, not all that many, decided that post-war, post-World War II, uh, international civil aviation would need to be regulated and that they should agree some regulations. Uh, and they set up ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, which does a lot of good things. Uh, some of some of the things those 52 states agreed, you think, would have been painful uh, to uh, enforce, and, and maybe they were. Um, one of the things they agreed right back in 1944 was that uh, international civil aviation would take place in English. English would be the, the language of aviation to avoid confusion. They also agreed units, which include such things that may sound antiquated to you as uh, altitude being measured in feet. But that's what they agreed. Now, uh, every country in the in the United Nations, every country in the world, pretty well, uh, apart from Liechtenstein, which is assumed to comply uh, via Germany, um, has signed up to this. Uh, so, you know, the international civil civil. Okay, uh, everybody has agreed to essentially the. Uh, those original treaties. Um, or, oddly enough, it wasn't until the 21st century that uh, the compulsory use of English was enforced um, as a result of 
some accidents, some aviation accidents resulting from linguistic confusion. And I hope, I'm stressing the language because one of my last suggestions is about language for AI. Um, only two airports said they would have trouble with uh, speaking pure English. One was Charles de Gaulle in Paris and the other was Montreal International, um, which is interesting when you consider the whole world having to speak English. Um, accident investigation, again, they've got an exemplary track record on um, because not only are aviation accidents thoroughly investigated uh, uh, by a suitably qualified team and thoroughly investigated as well. They don't just say, oh, well, <laughs> things crash. What the hell? Turn it off and turn it on again. Now, they work out why uh, so that it can be fixed. And crucially, uh, the results of the investigation are published. They can be published in the, the language in which the investigation has been conducted, but they must also be published in English. Uh, so you, the, when I say read up about Air France AF 447, you can read it in French or you can read it in English, but it's available for all the world to see. And I think this is the sort of model that we need to uh, consider in AI. Um, and again, this didn't put... Uh, civil aviation out of business you could say well pandemic and global pollution i think these are things to that <coughs> threaten aviation yes they are yes they do but regulation didn't threaten it uh, and nor did it end innovation but it did uh, improve safety and acceptance um so on my claim that you might you might or might not agree this is another whitbyism um and I guess a lot of philosophers don't agree about that, but my claim is some ethics is better than no ethics at all. I can make some suggestions as to what direction we go in in the world where we're going to have to live with AI. Um, and uh, I'm not claiming to have a complete set of regulations, but I, I will set out just a few key points, not an exhaustive list, I'm claiming that there should be some regulations. What do I want the regulations to cover? Well, here's my suggestions. Protection of vulnerable users. Uh, accountability, which is basically, um, if it's not a human who actually is a locus of responsibility, it's at least a legally defined, uh, a, a legally defined uh, person or entity that we can go to when there is a mess up rather than just you know, uh, what drove Stephen Metcalf into the area. No, can't say. No idea why that's happened. No idea why that's happened. No one's responsible. Is not good enough. Uh, restriction of anthropomorphic design. Uh, you might think that's a bit harsh, but, uh, well, I, I think it does need restricting because it, it's it, my objections to the word artificial intelligence show where I'm going with this, claiming that things are more human-like than they are. Um, Banning of artificial emotion. Artificial emotion is machines pretending to have emotions. The reason I want that banned is because we know for sure from the psychological research that it's incredibly easy to fool people with displays of emotions. People can't help but respond emotionally to a, a simulation of emotion by a machine, even if they know it's a simulation, even if they know it's a trick. Um, I, uh, and it's because we're humans. Uh, the, the way I normally explain this is um, cats rub themselves against your leg and people say, oh, you know, uh, that's because they think you're another cat. Well, that, now it's true that exchange of sense like that by rubbing the face is the standard greeting among fe felines and so on. But cats don't think you're a cat. They, they know perfectly well you're an ape, but they only have cat behavior in their repertoire. So again, I'm going to concite the, the psychological experiments. If a robot pretends to cry, you can't help, or all but the very psychopathic individuals, can't help but respond to this apparent display of tearfulness by a robot, even if they know it's a trick. Um, not because they're stupid, but because they only have human behavior in their repertoire. Uh, again, <coughs> come... <coughs> taking from aviation i think we need no blame investigation when things go wrong things will go wrong it's just in the nature of things um for sure there will be uh, 
fatal accidents with autonomous vehicles. Um, the way to do that is to investigate it on a no-blame basis. Again, it's a job for techies. No stone unturned. Work out why it's happened so we can stop it happening again. And last of all, by lingua franca, I mean there's too much vagueness of terms. Even I've done all this hand-waving, I've said this. Artificial neural nets and deep learning and basically they're just statistical techniques over data. This isn't good enough. If you want to involve the public and get them to understand what's going on, we've got to tie down some terms um, and, and, and stop using proprietary terms and whatever language Microsoft want to use for the technology and Apple want to use different terms to emphasize that they're different. No, we need to agree uh, a common terminology. Again, partly like aviation, common measurements and so on. And we're a long way from that in the AI area. Uh, so it just remains for me to say, for anyone who has been, thank you for listening. Here's um, some of the things I mentioned, uh, including the EPSRC Principles of Robotics. And just in case you don't believe me, there's the 1988 publication. I've been talking about this stuff for a long time. Uh, I've covered a big area here with quite some strongly opinionated stuff. Probably forgot to say some stuff, but I'll, uh, I'll stop there and open it for questions, if I may. Okay, well, thank you very much, Ray, for a, a very thought-provoking um, presentation. We were we were chatting before we actually went live on on YouTube, and, and you you suggested that uh, an obvious question to ask you was why don't we have a minister for AI? And I think you sort of touched on that during your talk. So let me twist the question a little bit and say. If we did have a Minister for AI, what would you make their immediate priorities? Um, well, I, I think pretty much as I've said, I, I'd want them to um, attend international meetings and try and set up a convention, a bit like, a bit like the Chicago Convention. We need to agree things. Um, if we did have a Minister for AI now, they certainly wouldn't be the first. Um, for example, the United Arab Emirates has a Minister for AI. Um, and uh, again, it, it's not too soon to enter this area. It's not too soon to talk about international regulation. I, I suspect we would have to make some compromises uh, and some people in this country might not like some of the compromises because there's no doubt, if, if I looked at, uh, at the Chinese use of AI, they, they're quite prepared to use facial recognition techniques combined with big databases uh, to uh, impose penalties or take away people's social credit. Um, and we maybe would have to compromise and, and say uh, that we would do that. I have to say, how much can I say publicly? There are people in this country who think that's quite a good idea. Um, and if, if you think it's a terrible idea, then you really need to let the, uh, well, let your MP hear right now, because there are all sorts of reasons why you might want to do it. Um, and it's technologically, it, it's doable. Um, question from Chris. Do you think there can ever be a balance or are mass job losses and a dystopian future inevitable? Personally, I think there could be a balance. Um, the, the thing is, if, if you filled a room with experts on this, 30% would say, we're all doomed, there's no work. Um, and I, I could almost name the people who are saying that. Uh, 30% would say there's nothing to worry about, and 30% like me would say we're going to have to rethink, but it'll be all right in the end. Uh, I'm all for rethinking. I, I suppose I'd also have to say maybe 50% of the people in the room would say what we need is a universal basic income. We should pay people whether or not they work because the idea that everyone can find work is out of date. I wouldn't be in that 50% because I think people need the feel 
they need the feeling that they're making a useful contribution to society and not everybody is happy to sit at home and do nothing um to which they would say well you know they wouldn't sit at home and do nothing they'd become great painters or musicians or philosophers uh, because they wouldn't have to worry about feeding themselves and again i don't think everybody has what it takes to be a great painter or a great musician or a great philosopher uh, so you would still get problems from taking that approach um, a lot of it we haven't seriously discussed because We've cruised through to the pandemic in a in a strange employment model where uh, a lot of people have way too much work. Um, a lot a lot of people are being seriously overloaded. They're doing far too much, and a lot of people have far too little. And some people end up with none. Um, and one thing we could do straight away is say if there's a shortage of work for our uh, seven. 0.3 billion humans, we could distribute it more fairly. We could restrict the working week. Um, and that's hardly discussed at all in these debates. And, and I would I would be, vote for restricting the working week. Um, it, maybe it would have a different name. It would be, you know, work-life balance policy and so on. But if everybody was on a four-day week, uh, I, I don't know that there'd be a problem. And of course, post-pandemic, a lot of these opportunities open up. Um, so do I think there could be a balance? Yes, I do. I still think there's plenty of things for humans to do. Um, and they're not all uh, sitting at home painting in oils. But, <laughs> but um, really, it, it's a shame there, aren't, there, are, there isn't more attention and, and some more of these great minds thinking about this because it's coming um there was a report last year presented which actually looked at the employment impacts by constituency and that was that was the one evening when you know <laughs> there were more mps than than academics and industrialists in the appg because that that got the attention of the mps when they knew how many people in their constituency were likely to be made unemployed. They suddenly got an interest in this. Um, anyway, have I said enough to answer that question? I think so, yes. Um, coming at a slightly different angle now, um, the military development of AI, does it basically re render the development of ethical standards obsolete because sooner or later it will come to crunch time? Yes and no. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a lot to this. I once gave a public talk um, in Brighton and somebody there pushed me a similar question to this. Uh, you know, a, a woman said, uh, it doesn't matter what you think. You can stand here and spout these ethics. But when it comes to the development of robots, the US military call the shots and they don't have to listen to you. They're providing the main funding and so on. And I said, um, interestingly, uh, yeah, you're right. Um, I can say what I like, but the US military are providing uh, most of the funding for robot development. That may or may not be true in 2021 because there's been a lot more civilian interest, but that's what I said. However, after that, I <laughs> decided to try and get a copy of my 1968 book. <laughs> Uh, which uh, which had, um, I'd lost and it's and it's long out of print and I bought it online second hand bought it online second hand here it is here's the copy I got online second hand when it arrived it had been um, it had been in a library it was a library copy and it was stamped up property of the U.S. Army right here we go uh, U.S. Army Office of Missile Command, Technical Library, Redstone Arsenal, right? stamped up, a library copy. So the interesting thing was the US military don't need to listen to me, but my book had been in their library. Right? So uh, they are having a chance. The other thing you need to know about the military is there's a petition before the United Nations has been for three or four years now, signed by a number of people, including me, uh, <coughs> trying to impose a moratorium on 
the ability of autonomous uh, unmanned vehicles to deploy to autonomously deploy lethal force in other words against killer drones um, and you can guess what my objection is uh, my objection is that people are going to hide behind the no responsibility thing they're going to say we can't tell you why the drone took out your village but you must have done something wrong say are oh, you see um, we can't tell you why and uh, I, I don't think that's acceptable it looks like uh, such a moratorium will not be passed and these things will be developed. Uh, and if you're interested, remember the last thing I suggested was a lingua franca. If you're interested, what's caused the problem is that um, we can't agree a definition of AI. We can't agree a definition of autonomy. That's actually been the problem in Geneva. Uh, it's been a problem of definition. Uh, and while there are these definitional problems, it's unlikely we can make any progress on that. Uh, does that answer the question, or have I, have I slipped off? Yeah, I, I, I think it does. But there's a couple, couple more questions. There's another um, thing I'd like to say on that, which is I've, I've published a paper um, called Caring Robots More Dangerous Than Killer Robots. And basically that paper makes the, uh, the point that military use of robots is actually highly regulated. There's the Geneva Conventions, uh, there's uh, the rules of engagement in particular case, there's all sorts of regulations that the military have to deal with. If you make uh, a robot helper, uh, an assistant, or a, you know, a, a sex robot, there's no regulation whatsoever. It's the that, that's the point of that paper. There's no regulation in the use of robots in the caring professions. Nobody's made any rules at all, not even any ethical guidance. Um, you had you had some more. Questions. Sorry, I, that was my grandson was just attempting to join the meeting. So. Um, the, the you mentioned the the Amazon CV system. Yeah. Um, and I wonder whether it was actually deliberate to train it on past successful uh, applicants in the sense that it was rather than re removing bias, it was trying to maintain the status quo quo and and actually have conscious bias, if you like. What's your view? If I'd been, if I'd been in the lab when that was done, I probably wouldn't have spotted it. We, we need, you know, we don't want to go through thousands of applications. We need something to pull out the top 5%. So we train the neural net on what gives us the, the, the top 1%. And then, you know, we then we don't have to look at them all, we'll look at the ones it selects. Um, I have to say something important about this too, which is don't think it's just Amazon. Um, the last meeting uh, of the ACPG on AI where we dealt with recruitment, almost every London recruitment agency said they sorted CVs with an AI program. Only one company, I just not, since I've talked to a lot of people, I have to say the man IBM said, we saw what happened at Amazon, we've learned to, from Amazon, or we never used a program to sort our CVs. I don't know if it's well, that's what we said in the meeting. Um, but an awful lot of people are using this software, in spite of my protest that if Amazon couldn't get it right, what makes you think you can get it right, which is what I say when I'm invited to speak. Um, they, are, they often have the hubris to think they can do better than Amazon. Um, yeah, I, actually, I, it's a splendid example. I think. It, it shows what problems you've got uh, in using this, these, uh, these machine learning techniques to sort things. You, know, you are essentially asking for more of the same, and you mm. might not want more of the same. Yeah, I, I think we've got time for one final question, and this, this comes from Ronald, who says, what are the security concerns considering we import AI machines from countries like China? <laughs> the honest truth is, I don't know. And all I can say is you should be very worried. Last century, I used to say the next war will be a cyber war. And sometimes if there were military people there, they'd say, how do you know that? And I'd say, oh, I'm just guessing. Um, now they'd laugh at me if I said that. They'd say, what do you mean the next war? It's already on. We're already in it, and, and we're absolutely deep in it. Um, 
again, a thing for any technical members, what I spend a lot of my time doing uh, for the European Commission is to point out to people who are doing research on cryptography, passwords, or that area of computing that under EU regulations, they count as weapons of mass destruction. And exporting cryptographic software, for example, to America, is like exporting plutonium, as far as they're concerned, because that is now considered a major weapon of war. So yeah, even the European Commission have woken up to what's actually going on. Um, and as for using stuff from China, I, I, I would really assume the worst, actually. Um, I'm, and I'm sorry, because I'm, I'm, I'm not usually an assume the worst sort of person, but the cyber war is on. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Okay, I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, Lay, but we seem to be having a few problems with the, the sound. So many thanks for uh, a very interesting uh, presentation and for the answers to the questions. Many thanks to everyone who submitted questions. Um, I'm sorry if we didn't get through your question this evening. Um, if you've enjoyed this evening, please make sure that you push the like button and let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our channel. That really does help us. And hit the notification bell to be informed about the new BCS content. Talking of new BCS content, our next event is on Thursday, the 22nd of April. It's Will Moy from Full Fact, which is a fact checking agency. So. Thank you all very much for watching and a very good evening to you.